Tonight we're in 1 Samuel chapter 14, so if you have your Bibles, open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 14. Let's pray, and we're going to jump right in the middle of the story of Samuel with Saul and all that's going on here in this whole episode, some really great stuff tonight. But 1 Samuel chapter 14, let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and Lord, we love you and we love your word. And I, Lord, I understand loving your word because that's you. You are the word. And you became man, and yet still God. And you became flesh, and you dwelt among us. And Lord, while we know you are a being, and you're not ink on paper, you are the Word. And you manifest yourself to us. You show yourself to us through your Word. So God, do that tonight. We want to know you, Jesus. Nothing else matters. Father, let us know you. Let us know your Son and do it through your word by the power of your spirit coming upon us, your believers. Lord, you're welcome in this place. Do what you want. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We jump in in chapter 14 in the right in the middle of the story of, sad story of Saul, really. Saul started out good, but really he had internal flaws in his inner man that were there from the very beginning, but they manifested over time very quickly. At the beginning, he was small in his own eyes, but still he had the character flaws within him and God would have given him what he needed to get over those and to grow past those had he just obeyed the Lord. But he didn't obey the Lord, so his character flaws took over and it was the demise of Saul. Now you might be saying, what about me? I don't have great character and I've got character flaws. And I know that I've had many character flaws throughout my life and I'm sure God still sees the ones that I have. But the difference is God can take a man or a woman who has character flaws and use them for his kingdom and grow them and mature them if they'll simply obey. That's the key. If we will simply obey, God will use us and take us beyond where we are and, and use us in greater ways than we could, well, first of all, that we could ever be used at all by him, but secondly, use us in greater ways than we could ever imagine. But it comes down to obedience. Saul is a sad story of a man who was disobedient and rebellious and uh, could have had a great kingdom and a great future with his family. And instead, we see him dissolve in a situation where he ends up being killed by the enemy, an enemy he should have killed long in advance. But we take him in the middle. If you remember last week, or last not last week, two times ago, before we went to Israel, in chapter 13, Samuel had sent Saul down and said, Now, Saul, we're going to be fighting uh, uh, the enemies of God here. So what I want you to do is go down there and wait on me, get the, get the sacrifice ready, but wait on me and I'll show up and I'll offer the sacrifice to God. And you guys go to battle because that's how God designed it. The priest offers the sacrifice. The king leads the people into battle. Well, Saul went down there, if you remember, and Samuel didn't call, come on Saul's time clock. God didn't move when Saul was expecting, you know, we have this thing in our mind, you know, Lord, you've got this much time. So I've got to have this by tomorrow at noon, and if it doesn't happen, then I've got to do something. And Saul's had to learn a hard lesson that God does it in his time and in his way. And so Saul, rather than waiting for Samuel, who showed up right after Saul did this, Saul went and offered the sacrifice himself, putting himself in the place of a priest, in the place he wasn't called, in the place that God had not given him that right. And he sinned against God, rebelled against God. Uh, because of that, Samuel shows up and says, what have you done? Didn't you know that I'm supposed to do this? Why did you disobey the Lord? And this whole scene that happens here in 13, well now we get past that and now we get into chapter 14 and we continue on. God was faithful to Saul to continue to use him uh, even beyond this simply because God loved his people and, and God wanted to minister to his people. And by the, way, by the way, that is an interesting thing I see in scripture. God will eventually remove a man or a woman that's in rebellion, but God will use them for a while even while they're in their rebellion because God loves his people. I remember seeing a pastor one time, it didn't come out till later, that he was living in sin behind the scenes. And he'd been doing it for a couple of years. And yet during those years, God was still using him to teach the people. And people were coming to Christ, getting saved. Um, almost more so than before he started sinning. So you look at that and go, wow, that doesn't compute. Well, eventually he collapsed, God removed him and it was done. So there's only a limited amount of time God will allow that. But what it taught me was this, God loves his people so much, he'll use anybody that's there to minister to his people. Now, if God can't use them anymore, God will remove them. But God will use any of us in this room if we'll make ourselves available for God to use us. Saul will still be used here, although he's not in the right place with God. And this is where we take up in chapter 14. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, and by the way, Jonathan was the one that was righteous of the two. You wonder why he wasn't chosen to be king. 
It happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Now, Jonathan was always a man who took ventures of faith. How God loves these guys. And if you want to be somebody that the Lord really loves, of course, he loves us all, but one that he loves to watch his kids take ventures of faith. Now, not ventures of presumption. We can take ventures of pres presumption. I'm going to take Knoxville for God. Well, not if God hadn't called you to, you're not. And you can march around it all the times you want and make all these proclamations and name it and claim it. Nothing's going to change. You may get a bunch of people excited and hyper, and they may follow you for a while, but they'll find out that it's man's strength and not God's, and, so, and then it'll fizzle. But if God has called you to do it, then there's going to be success in the midst of it. And God loves it when, when God puts it in our heart. You know what? If you'll just step out of faith and do whatever, and we just obey him, and we know that God's leading, even though the odds seem so against us, God loves that. Because it gives God an opportunity to show his power and to show his glory. Jonathan was that guy. Jonathan took steps of faith on a regular basis. Now, he wasn't foolish. He didn't take blind presumption. We're going to see in this episode, Jonathan verifies that it's the Lord. But then when he finds out it's God, he's not afraid of anything. Jonathan truly understood with God, it's a majority. He understood that. And I love that about Jonathan. You can see why Jonathan and David loved each other so much and became so close. His heart linked with David. David's heart linked with him. They were both men who loved the Lord and were men who would step out and just take a venture of faith. They weren't afraid, you know. And um, I love that. He says, but he didn't tell his dad. And Saul was sitting on the, basically, I'm going to go attack the Philistines just because God doesn't want him here and I'm going to trust in God. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, with his, which is in Migron. And the people who were with him uh, were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli. Remember, this is the, the rebellious family of Eli. This is one of his, uh, uh, another family member. God's going to eventually remove all of Eli's families from serving. But he at this time was in the line of Eli. And he now is operating as the priest. The Lord's priest in Shiloh was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes and the name of the other Sinan. Now, to name rocks, they've got to be pretty impressive. Well, look at that guy. What are we going to call him? Let's call him Bozes. Oh, that's great. Perfect. What about him? Sinan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like that works. Bozes and Sinan. Perfect. Perfect. Anyway, I'm being silly, but they named these guys. That's how prominent they were in this region here. It says, the front of one faced northward opposite Michmash and the other southward opposite Gibeah. So they faced each other and there were two prominent places there where they could clearly be seen. And Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, come and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by few or by many or by many or by few. The concept, he gets it. If God's going to do it, it doesn't matter if there's a huge army or if there's one person. We're going to get the victory because God's the one doing it. And I love this. He says these uncircumcised, uh, that is these unsaved. And basically the Philistines were making fun of the Jews and mocking them and all this. And I think Jonathan probably going, you know, who are you guys? You don't know our God. We have a powerful God. You're making fun of us. Well, let's just see what our God wants to do. You'll know about the God of Israel. And so again, just, he didn't, he just was bold. You know, some people are just bold and brave. And I love people like this. And if you've got that bold and brave spirit, if you can be bold and brave for the Lord, God will use you in amazing ways. I've had friends that were bold and brave, but not necessarily for the Lord. I almost might call it stupid. Uh, I had this one guy I used to ride in the car with him, and I'd be driving the car, and if we turn left, he'd sit on the right side. We turn left. First time we did, it scared me to death, and I got used to it after the first couple of times. He would open the door and just fly outside and look at me and start screaming. The door would fly, and he'd go, ah! And I'd go, ah! And I'd realize he's not falling out. He's playing a game. He'd get back in and start laughing, close the door. I'm like, you're an idiot. You know, you, you could have died. I could have wrecked, whatever. It's the same guy. Remember, what, remember M80s? Remember what M80s are? These little, they're, what were they, a quarter stick of dynamite? They used to sound if they really were that powerful, but they were loud and strong. And, and this guy, I don't know why I'm telling you these stories, but I will finish this one since I started it. He, he, same guy that would fly out the door. One day he just sent a friend, he's got an M80, lights it, and I'm in the back. He'd just toss it gently in the back. And we got like four people in the back. There's nowhere to go. And we're all just like every man for himself. We're like balling up and go, boom, this big flash in the car. It fills the smoke. <laughs> you know, we're like dying. Couldn't hear for a week anyway. Um, if you get a guy like that and get him on fire for God, you can't stop him. Jonathan was the type that said, you know what, I'll, I'll fling the door open. He didn't do that, but you get my point. It's like, I'll do, if God says do it, I'm not afraid. 
boldness for God. And I love this about Jonathan. And we're going to, again, we're going to see there's balance here. He's not foolish. He's just bold for God. Verse 7, so his armor bearer said to him, do, the, do all that's in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you according to your heart. Don't you love encouragers? You know, I think God's calling me to step out and do this. Go for it. Really? Yes. Well, if God's calling you to do it, but it's impossible. Nothing's impossible with God. If, God. if you feel God's called you to do it, step out and do it. So you need people around you like that. What you don't need is the guy that says, ah, you can't do that. Why? I feel like God's calling me. Well, other guys have tried it. You know, you, know, you can't really, you don't need that. Get away from that person. If you have that person in your life, say, you know, it's good being friends with you, but I'm not going to hang out. Find the person that will say, you feel like God's told you? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. What's the worst that can happen? Listen, the worst that can happen is it's not successful and maybe it was you and not God. The best that can happen is it is God and God does something amazing through your life. You know, we got one shot at this thing. Why not take a venture of faith? Why not step out and do something radical for the Lord? This was Jonathan and he's got a guy with him that God's raised up that's there going, you know what, you go for it, I'm with you. You know, it's Batman and Robin. Bam, slam, kabowie, you do it. We can take this thing. And that's what they're gonna do. It's gonna be a Batman and Robin scene here in just a moment. Um, if you could remember the old Batman and Robin show, you could see in your mind the cabal, the boom, the slam, it's all there. Anyway, then Jonathan said, very, <laughs> very well, let us cross over to these men and show ourselves to them. And he gives, again, he gives a test here. Let's see if God's in this. If they say thus to us, wait, we'll come up to you. Then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we'll go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand and this will be a sign to us. Or if they say, wait until we come to you, we won't. But if they say, you come to us, that'll be God saying, all right, I'm gonna give you the victory. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. Now remember the children of Israel were hiding in this area because they were afraid of the Philistines. The Philistines were ruling over them at this time for the most part. So suddenly they come out and just kind of, here we are, you know. What are you going to say? What are you going to do, right? And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden. And the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we'll show you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Isn't that great? That's all we need. I, I think he, he's looking for an excuse to go after these guys. You know, that's kind of how Jonathan was. And so he now has his signal from the Lord, and Jonathan's ready to rock and roll. He said, let's do this thing. Let's go for it. And Jonathan, I love this. Look at this. This hill that he had to climb to go fight these guys. One thing to go fight a bunch of guys you're outnumbered in. It's another thing to have to get exhausted before you get there. Look what it says. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and his knees with his armor bearer after us. These guys are coming up on their hands and knees to these Philistines and they're outnumbered. And they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. So Jonathan's going through, going, bam, bam, probably killing some of them. Some of them just falling down halfway silly. The armor bearer's coming behind killing them. Great teamwork in this battle here. This is the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within a, within a half acre of land. That's, that's a small area, killing 20 guys. I mean, we're not quite a Bruce Lee movie, but getting there, you know, all these people just falling around him as he's doing all this stuff, just amazing to see what's happening. And there was trembling in the camp and in the field. Again, we're going to see there's Fear trembling, but God's going to bring physical trembling to the ground. Look at this. And among all the people, the garrison and the raiders also trembled and the earth quaked so that it was a very great trembling. God literally sent an earthquake to back these guys up. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to fight these guys. God says, well, you know what? You're not going to fight them. I'm going to do this. I know you can't beat 20 guys with two. So I'm going to send an earthquake, shake those guys up. You're going to wipe them out. We're going to scare the rest of the camp, get them running. This is what God does. He fights for us. And does amazing things. You know, when you step out again, that venture of faith, God will begin to do amazing things. And the watchman of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away. I love that imagery. Just kind of running and melting away as they went here and there. And Saul said to the people who were with him, call the roll and see who's gone from us. So they're watching this. They see the enemy over there running all directions going, Why are, what's happening? Why are the Philistines freaking out? And when they called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. For at that time, the ark of God was with the children of Israel. And it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. In other words, I don't have time to hear what God has to say. Let's go. And again, this gets back to the problem that Saul had. 
He didn't want to do things God's way. In the, in the last battle, he wanted to do his own sacrifice because the pastor didn't show up soon enough, if you want to put it in modern day language, whatever. He's going to just do his own thing, whatever. And of course, we don't have the same setup with pastors they have with priests then. So the application is not real complete there, but you get the idea, trying to make it more modern. And now he calls the priest again and says, you know what? We need to hear what God wants. What are we supposed to do? And he sees the battle goes, forget that. Let's just go. And again, Saul was impatient and Saul was unwilling to not only wait on the Lord, but to see what God would have him do. And again, this is the demise of Saul. Learn this lesson. We all need to learn it, to wait on God and to make sure that we're hearing the voice of God to know what we're supposed to do. If you just run into battle, well, you may look impressive for a minute while you're screaming until somebody shoots you. But if you wait on God, God says, do it this way, you'll be successful. This was Saul's issue. Now, God's still going to give them the victory for Jonathan's sake and for the children of Israel's sake. But Saul here again is showing his character in his lack of love for God, obedience to God, and trust in God, and impatience. And Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was very great confusion. I love this. You look at the battles in Scripture, and God takes the enemies of, of Israel, and he confuses them, and they fight each other. It's all through the Scripture. Now, how in the world they could, you know, I don't, I don't know how that works. You know, you're in the camp of your own guys and you're drawing swords and it's daytime and you start attacking each other. I mean, I would be thinking, okay, I, I think I can figure this one out. You're on my team. But God just confused them and they're attacking each other. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them to the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. So there were some Hebrews that were there among the Philistines, you know, people that were living among them and they thought were going to be with them and they could trust them. But now they're joining Israel while they're in the middle of the camp. And likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth-Avon. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I've taken vengeance on my enemies. Oh, how noble that must have sounded, right? No one eats until Saul has victory over the enemy. That's called foolish. Why in the world would you do that? Pride. Pride. I, you know, I'm going to show this. We're going to deny ourselves. And we're going to go, you know, whatever this, this statement Saul's making. God didn't tell Saul to do that. And what, what, what kind of vow is that to take? You're in the middle of battle. Nobody eat until we win. Well, we need strength to win. So maybe we should eat and drink water and not just do this or whatever. And so he makes this foolish vow, um, you know, here. And, and again, it just shows... Just the choices that Saul was making, but again, Saul's disconnect to God because he wasn't obeying and because he wasn't following God's plan, he's disconnected. And anytime we're disconnected from the Lord, when the battle comes, we're going to make foolish choices. I've done it. The battle rages. I've not been in prayer. I've not been in the word. And what do I do? Something really dumb. Now, maybe you've been there. If you haven't, you probably will be. Hopefully you won't be. Hopefully you'll stay in the word and stay in prayer. But if you find yourself in that case, you're going to be making foolish decisions because you're not in tune with the Spirit of God. This is where Saul is. And now the whole nation, his whole army is suffering because of his downfall. And all the people of the land came to a forest and there was honey on the ground. Now God said it was a land of milk and honey. Quite literally, there's filling this forest. There's honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping. And imagine they're hungry and they see this beautiful honey and it's dripping out of the comb. But they had no one put his hand to his mouth for the people feared the oath. It's interesting. They still get honey from this region. As a matter of fact, you can buy honey from that region. It's very tasty honey. I've had some of it. Uh, the bees are still very active there. And yet they get there and they can't have any of the honey because of this crazy, ridiculous oath. Uh, that Saul has made. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Remember, Jonathan was out doing the battle. And therefore, he stretched out the end of his rod that was in his hand, no doubt from his horse. He dipped it in the honeycomb, put it to his mouth, and his countenance brightened. This, this is good stuff. I'm getting some nourishment. It tastes great, whatever. So here he is just enjoying the honey and the honeycomb, doing all this thing. And one of the people saw him. And look, they said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath saying, cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. But Jonathan, again, he recognized this wasn't an oath from God. Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. In other words, what if everybody just been able to eat freely what they wanted? How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, in addition to this honey even, which they found. For now would there not 
have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? Now, they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint. Again, you think about a battle and not being able to eat all day and all this going on. They'd, they'd have been faint had they eaten. And the people rushed on the spoil. So the Philistines take off. They rush on the reward that they have from all the tents and all their animals. And notice it says, and they took sheep and oxen and calves, and they slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. Explanation. You couldn't eat the meat without draining the blood according to the Jewish law. So the priests and the, and the people as well in their homes would kill the animal, drain the blood. Once the blood was drained, they had a technique that would do that. Then they could skin the animal and eat it. They were so hungry, they were just killing the animals and skin them, putting them on the grill. And they're going, wait, we're not following God's, you know, demand here because they were starving. They were so hungry and they were so weak. And so I'm not taking up for them, but Saul had put them in this tough position where they're just responding to the desperation of their flesh. And Saul said, then they told Saul saying, look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. And he said, you've dealt treacherously. Roll a stone to me this day. And Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep and slaughter them here and eat. In other words, drain the blood, do it properly, and don't sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. Now, Saul wasn't very concerned about not sinning against the Lord, but he sure could preach it to other people, couldn't he? So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night and slaughtered it there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first altar that he built to the Lord. Now, Saul's been the king for quite some time. Why is this the first altar? Again, because I believe it shows Saul's heart. Saul wasn't in the place he needed to be. And Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until morning light. And let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. So let's don't stop the battle. We've eaten, we're refreshed, we're strengthened. We, yeah, we hadn't had any sleep, but let's go after them. Let's go. And then the priest said, let us draw near to God here. And so Saul asked the counsel of God and, and, and it said, shall I go down after the Philistines? So the priest said, Saul, let's ask the Lord about this before we jump into it, which by the way, notice, which is always a wise thing to do. And the priests are thinking about it, getting the eyes toward the Lord. Saul wasn't thinking that way. Saul, again, working and operating in the flesh. The priest brings some level of spirituality back to it. And so he says, all right, let's do that. Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But God didn't answer him that day. And again, you know, they, they had the ways they would look at the Urim and the Tumim, they called it, and they would, how they would be, how it was revealed, we don't exactly know. There are different um, theories about that. But God didn't answer. Why? Because Saul was in sin. God wasn't speaking to Saul right now. That's why Saul later on is going to go to the witch at Endor. He's going to try to use spiritism to hear something spiritual because God's not speaking to him. And yet recognizing that he, rather than recognizing that he needs to repent, he starts, we're going to see he blames the people. He blames others. He's going to blame Jonathan. And Saul said, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what sin uh, was today. You know, what this sin is. Well, it's you, but either way. For as the Lord lives who saves Israel, though it be Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. Now again, it's interesting. A lot of times people that are the most demonstrative and the most uh, religious sounding are oftentimes the ones that are the most guilty. And look at Saul, you know, this real aggressive, we'll kill whoever the one is that did. Well, Saul, really, you're the one that caused this whole problem, you know? Remember David when he was guilty with Bathsheba? And they come to David and, and Nathan gives him this story to reveal a sin. And what does he do? He doesn't just say, hey, that guy should really be caught and be punished. He goes, you know, he should give double back five times and then be killed. He starts pronouncing all these judgments against whatever. And Nathan says, oh, that's you, you're the guy. Oh, well, maybe we shouldn't be quite so harsh on him. <laughs> Let's rethink this, you know? And... There's a tendency to be harsher on others when we're the one in sin. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's self-righteousness. I don't know. But he's like, he shall die even if it's my own son. Of course, that would sound very magnanimous and very noble. And he's always trying to look good in front of the people. Wow, he would sacrifice his own son for the sake of God. Baloney. He would, but not for God's sake, for his own. It says, but not a man among the people answered. And see, everybody knew that Jonathan had done this. They knew that Jonathan had eaten the honey he wasn't supposed to. But they knew that Jonathan had led the battle and given him victory. They didn't want to turn him in. And he said to Israel, all of Israel, you be on one side, and my son and Jonathan and I will be on the other side. So he puts the whole, all of his nation over there, all the army, and he and Jonathan stand alone. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. And so therefore Saul said to the God of Israel, give a perfect lot. They would cast a lot, um, you know, to see. God worked through that in that day. And Saul and Jonathan were taken, 
But the people escaped, and Saul said, cast lots between my son and Jonathan and me. So Jonathan was taken. So again, whether or not God was just, you know, honoring um, the priests and finding out who it was that hadn't obeyed the king, or whether it was a 50-50 shot and they were just casting lots and God wasn't with them, we don't know. But it falls on Jonathan. And Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you've done. And Jonathan told him and said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of my rod that was in my hand. So now I must die? And Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. Again, how noble, right? But the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die? I can imagine the people stepping forward. Wait a minute, and the crowd's starting to stir. Shall Jonathan die, who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. And I love it. The people rise up and say, you're not going to kill Jonathan. He's our hero. Today. He's the one that gave us victory against the Philistines. As the Lord lives, not a hair of his head shall fall to the ground. For he has worked with God this day. Notice I love that balance. He's worked with God. Paul says this, we are co-workers with the Lord. God gives the victory, but who has to step out and do something? If God says, I want you to do something, we can sit back all day and say, well, God has to do it, but we have to show up. We have to do our part. We have to pray, get in the word, be there and say, now God do something. So we work with God and God waits on us to do our part, even though it's God that does the work. And I love how it phrases it here. It says, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan and he didn't die. And Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines and the Philistines went to their own place. So Saul established his sovereignty over Israel and he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he harassed them and he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. So it's amazing here. God is still using Saul. Although Saul's in rebellion, God's still using him. And again, why? Because God loves the nation of Israel. God loved his people. So he's going to use the leader that's there to bless them, even though he could have done so much more had Saul been obedient. And the sons of Saul were Jonathan, Jeshui, and Malkishua. And the names of his two daughters were, were these. The name of the firstborn was uh, Merab, and the name of the younger was Michael. The name of Saul's wife was Ahino Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimeaz. And the name of the commander of his army was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. And there was fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or the valiant men, he took him for himself. Remember, Samuel warned him this would happen. Samuel said, if you have a king, he's going to take your strongest sons, your, your, your most beautiful daughters, your, the best cooks, the best of everything. He's going to make them part of his kingdom. They're like, we don't care. We want a king. Well, now it's everything that Samuel warned them about is beginning to take place. Chapter 15, what an amazing chapter. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord has sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Now I love this because Saul still has a chance. Although Saul's been disobedient, although Saul has not been doing what God asked him to do, it's as if God's saying, I'm gonna give you another shot. You messed up Saul, but I anointed you king. And if you'll just obey me, I will bless you. I will use you. I will do a work in your life. Here's your shot. Now Saul's going to blow it in this one. And it's going to be, that's it. You're going to be removed from the kingdom. But I love the opportunities that God gives Saul. And God gave Saul quite literally years. We're years into his kingdom here. But at some point God says, enough is enough. And if you're going to disobey me, I'm going to remove you. I'm not going to use you anymore. And I'm going to take your anointing and your blessing away. And so now he says, all right, here it is. God's called you. Here's a reminder. I'm the prophet. I'm telling you what God said. Here's the command. Let's see if you'll obey it. Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts. Now remember, when the prophet said, thus says the Lord of hosts, who was speaking? It was God. You would not say in that day, thus says the Lord of hosts. You know, sometimes you hear these people that'll maybe stand up in, in an afterglow or maybe on some TV show or whatever. Thus says the Lord of hosts. And they say it. My hope and my thought is that better be the Lord. There's nothing wrong in standing up in an afterglow and saying, I believe God wants to say this to us. There's nothing wrong in that. And I believe standing up and saying, God's put this on my heart. There's nothing wrong in that. So don't ever fear that in an afterglow. If you feel God's putting something on your heart, then share it. You can say, I think God's put this on my heart. But if you say, thus says the Lord, what you're saying is, I'm about to speak scripture. 
This is the Bible about to come out of me. It is directly from God, the God of heaven, through me now down to you. That is a big deal. And God said, if somebody ever does that and it doesn't come to pass, they've shown themselves to be a false prophet. Samuel had proven to be a true prophet of God. And remember, the Bible says not a word that Samuel spoke in the name of the Lord fell to the ground. So why do I say that? Not only as a warning to us, but to emphasize in the story, when Saul heard Samuel say, thus says the Lord, and not just thus says the Lord, but thus says the Lord of hosts, that means the Lord of the armies of God, God's hosts in heaven, all of his angels. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Saul knew this is God Almighty speaking directly to me through a man who's been proven to be a prophet of God. I better listen. So realize the magnitude and the weight that God is giving this to see if Saul will pass the test. These are the words literally of God now coming through Samuel. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. How he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Remember, they would hide toward the back and they would attack uh, the stragglers and the weak and all that. And God says, That's, I'm, I'm going to judge them for that. That's disgusting. And go and attack Amalek. And notice the directive here. And utterly destroy all. Utterly destroy all. All, that is don't leave anything, wipe out completely all that they have and do not spare them. Notice this, it sounds harsh, but I'm going to explain this. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now, if you did not know the God of Israel and understand his omnipotence and his eternal nature, you would go, wow, this sounds so harsh. And wow, I can't believe God would really say, go kill everyone, even the children and all their animals and everything. I, I don't understand this. Let me explain. See, we think from an earthly plane. God is eternal. He knows everything from beginning to end. He knows what has happened. He knows everything that is happening. He knows everything that will happen. Which means God has a viewpoint about peoples and nations that we could never have. Which means God can see the damage they would do to humanity and their wickedness. And God has the right to prejudge that because he sees what's going to happen and to remove them so that doesn't happen. Let me put it in a modern day analogy. If, we, if you did not know that Hitler was evil and you didn't know that Germany was going to wipe out over 6 million Jews and try to take the world over prior to World War II. Say nobody knew anything. Okay. And somebody stood in the pulpit and said, thus says the Lord, God says, go and kill Hitler now. And all of his commanders now don't leave any of their family alive and kill all their army now. You would go, what a horrible thing. I can't believe a pastor would ever say that from a pulpit. And yet would that have been something that would have been wonderful from God? Absolutely. Why? Because God saw what Hitler was going to do to all these innocent women, children, and people. God saw what his wicked commanders were going to do to all these innocent women and children and all these Jews and everyone else and try to take the world over. Only God can make that call. Only God sees all things in advance. So God can say, wipe them all out. Because if you don't, they're going to wipe everybody else out. But Mark, what about the infants? Act of mercy. How's that an act of mercy? If those children grow up in that kind of wickedness, what are they going to be like when they're adults? Wicked. What if God takes them when they're babies? What will happen? Kingdom of God. The Bible says that, and I believe the Bible indicates that someone that dies before they understand what's going on, God's going to take them into the kingdom. Which means, although it may seem horrible, oh, they were killed by the sword. But rather than spending eternity in hell, they now go straight into the kingdom and go, whoa, yeah. You would have been in hell. Your mom and dad would have led you that way, but I wanted you in heaven, so I went ahead and took you. It may not have been the most fun, but now you're here forever. See how different God's perspective is? Now, if you don't know the Lord, and you don't know his perspective, you know, if God was to say to me, I know that Mark's gonna fall away. He's gonna walk away from God. He's gonna walk away from me. And he's gonna ruin people's lives because of it. I'm gonna go ahead and bring him to heaven. And then God kills me. How could a God of love? Thank you for the God of love that would love me enough to do that. Because I understand he just spared me and everybody else in their lives that I would ruin in my rebellion. I'm not saying I want God to do that. My point is, never judge God when God says wipe out everyone. He knows what he's doing and it's all based on his foreknowledge, his wisdom, and his love. Because it's God's way, I believe, of getting the young into the kingdom that would never have made it 
And it's God stopping those that are growing into that wickedness from destroying all the innocent people they would kill during their lives. And God says, I see the Amalekites. I see them. You don't know their future. I do. You don't know how wicked they are. I do. You don't know they're going to kill six million Jews. I do. So Saul, you go in, you wipe out Hitler and everybody with him. All of them leave none remaining. And if you do that, there won't be World War II. Now, nobody said that and that didn't happen. But had God said that, that could have been prevented. Now, God, that wasn't God's plan. God knows what he's doing. I'm not questioning what happened in the details of World War II. I'm making an application so you understand when you read this kind of stuff, the world's going to look at it and say, you're, that's the God you serve and the God that would do it. You have no idea how loving this verse is. Because God just fought for who, tens of thousands of innocent women and children against the wicked Amalekites and what they would have done in the future. And you have no idea how merciful and loving our God is by grabbing those children and very possibly bringing them into the kingdom rather than letting them be eternally condemned by growing up in such a wicked environment. Only God can judge. Only God sees all things. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in, in Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, go and depart down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Now, who were the Kenites? This was the family of Moses' father-in-law. Remember Jethro and the Clampets? They were Kenites. And um, not really. But do you remember Jethro? And he was a Kenite. And his family, they were Kenites. And these are the descendants of, of Moses' father-in-law. They stayed friendly to the children of Israel throughout the ages. As a matter of fact, the Bedouins that live out in the wilderness now still live out there. We, again, those of you that are in Israel just saw them out in the, living out there in the, in the wilderness. There are many scholars who say those are actually still the descendants of Kenites. Now, I don't know that DNA has been done to find out or what that would prove, but they say that this, these are the same descendants. They're just nomads. They travel around and live out there in the wilderness. And the reason they were separated, they were next to the Amalekites, but they weren't in the Amalekite cities because they were living out in the wilderness the same way they do today. And so as Bedouins do, and so they would go up to them in their tents and say, look, you got to get out of here because there's going to be a battle and we don't want you guys to be destroyed. You're friends of Israel. So they get out of there. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. Uh-oh. Now we begin to see again the disobedience of Saul. What did God say? Kill everybody but the king. No. Kill everyone. I know their future. You don't, Saul. I know what they're going to do. You stop them now, because if you don't kill them now, it's going to come back to kill you. It's interesting. Amalekites in Scripture are a type of the flesh. God uses the Amalekites all throughout Scripture to, to, to give a, a picture of what we are when we battle our flesh. He's about battling this, I'm having such a struggle in this area. That's the Amalekite in your life. If you're struggling with something tonight, it's an Amalekite. You know, you, you go to the fridge and you have a background of drinking and you just, you bought that six pack thinking, well, I'm not going to get drunk and it's okay as a Christian to have a drink, so I'm just going to have a drink. But then you have that drink and what happens? It kind of feels kind of good. You loosen up a little bit. So, well, yeah, I'm okay. I can have one more. I won't be drunk. With then you have one more. And then after one more, you're like, well, okay, I'm kind of could probably have one more and do okay. And then the ambitions are gone. Next thing you know, you're drunk. Get those Amalekites, pop the tab and pour them out. They're Amalekites. Amalekite light, get rid of it. Or whatever it is you're battling with. I'm not saying you can't have, again, I'm not getting on the alcohol issue. That's not my point. I'm saying it could be anything. Maybe it's shows that you watch that are just on the edge of, you know, they, they, I know they're all in bikinis, but I just, I really just, I'm really into beauty pageants. As a guy, yes, as a guy, I am. Isn't that usually a girl thing? Yeah, but as a guy, I'm really into it. Okay, okay. And then what happens? The Amalekites, over time, and now you find yourself falling away from the Lord. You fill in the blank. Whatever your Amalekite is, if it's, if it's causing you to fall away from God, it's an Amalekite. Destroy it. And here's the thing. If you don't utterly destroy the Amalekites, they will come back to destroy you. Well, I'll get rid of most of the Amalekites. I'll, I'll um, just watch one pageant a year or I'll, I know that I have a propensity to drink too much, so I'll throw away five of them and keep one. Listen, 
If you don't utterly destroy the Amalekites from your life in whatever area is causing you to stumble, it will come back to kill you spiritually. And oddly enough, we're going to see that he spares Agag and apparently some other Amalekite that got away or else Agag had some relationship with a woman before Samuel got to him because the Amalekites continue on because Saul didn't destroy them all. And guess who it is that kills Saul later on down the road? An Amalekite. Isn't that interesting? It's an Amalekite that puts Saul to death on Mount Gilboa. So if you don't kill the Amalekites, they will eventually come back and they will kill you. So whatever, and you're, why can't I be free? Probably, probably because there's an Amalekite you're hanging on to. You're probably getting rid of most everything, but there's that one little Amalekite that you kind of keep, you know, quiet, stay in there. You know, shh. The little Amalekite's going, no, just, shh, you know, what's that? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Sound like an Amalekite. I don't have any Amalekites. I got rid of all that stuff. Oh, okay, all right. And then you go back a week later, ooh, Amalekite, you've grown. <laughs> You're a lot bigger now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Maybe I'm going too far with this. <laughs> but you get the point, right? The principle's true, guys, and it's a serious principle. Take it seriously. If you've got Amalekites right now, you know what they are. They will destroy you spiritually if you don't go and utterly destroy them. I remember when I came to the Lord, I, and I don't want to sound spiritual because I wasn't. I was just so messed up. My life was so messed up, and I had so many things that were, that were destroying me, that when I gave my life to the Lord, I took everything and threw it away. Anything that could have anything to do with the world, everything went in the dumpster that could have anything to do with the world. I'm not telling you to go out and throw away all your stuff. I'm saying, I knew from my life, and I didn't know there were Amalekites at the time, but if I'd thrown most of them away and kept some of the more valuable Amalekites, or some that I really liked and could listen to later, or whatever I had, because I had a lot of bad music and a lot of bad magazines, or whatever, you know, if I'd kept those, I'm convinced I never would have made it in my walk with the Lord. But God put it in my heart. You throw it all away. You, and, and now I, I, I can read this. In, in other words, God was like, you utterly destroy the amount. Utterly destroy them. Get rid of all of them. Don't leave anything. Because if you do, on Mount Gaboa one day, there's going to be one waiting on you. And he's going to run you through. And your ministry is going to be done. Your family will be done. Your kids are going to disrespect you and hate you and all these things. Just deal with the Amalekites now and walk with Jesus. So he leaves Agag alive, utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. All he, all he left was one, but this one is going to lead to a progeny that's going to come back and kill him. So he left Saul, but spared Agag. And the best of the sheep, notice that, he told him to kill everything, but he kept the best of the sheep. Can't, well, that's too good of them. i got to keep that one. That's too nice, right? The oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. And notice this. Here shows the rebellion. And were unwilling... Not that they couldn't, just, I won't do it. Unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. In other words, the stuff that I don't really care about, you know, it was easy for me to quit smoking. You know why? I never smoked. <laughs> I'm giving up cigarettes for you, Jesus. You never smoked, you idiot. Oh, well, but you know what? I'm still giving it up for you. But I may hang on to this. Well, that's your struggle. Well, but I gave something up. Well, you're giving up something that's not a struggle. That's what Saul did. The stuff that's worthless, get rid of that. I'll get rid of that and that and that and that. But I'm going to hold on to these Amalekites. No, we have to say, no, what are the things that we need to get rid of? Saul, again, all the mistakes here. Everything despised and worthless, they, they utterly destroyed. The word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I set up Saul as king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. Look at the heart of Samuel. And he cried out to the Lord all night. Look at Samuel's love for Saul. I mean, Saul's in rebellion to God. And Samuel's not, you know what, that guy, he never did really. He's messed up so many times. He offered the sacrifice before I got there. He didn't obey in this. You know, it's like good, good riddance for him. Not the heart of a true man of God that loves God and loves his people. He's weeping. He's up all night going, God, have mercy on Saul. What's he doing? Why, what, what happened? And he cries. I mean, even more so to the point where God's going to say in a minute, you've got to stop crying out for Saul. And, and, but he, this shows his love for him. All night long, 
And when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel. This is not the one up in the north. This is down there toward the southern end, down toward Jericho and the desert area. There's another Carmel. And he says, indeed, he set up a monument for himself. How interesting. <laughs> I'm pretty great. You know. I, I, I think I'm pretty good. So I'm going to set up a monument for myself. Shows you, again, look how far he's going and how quickly. Away from God, it's all about Saul. And he has gone around, passed on, and gone down to Gilgal, which is down there by Jericho. And Samuel went to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. He starts speaking Christianese. Oh, there's Samuel. Hey, praise the Lord. Glad you're at church today, Sam. Good to see you. What? I know what you're doing. Why are you using all this Christianese on me? You're a phony, Saul. But Saul wants to try to trick Sam. You can't trick the prophet. He knows what's going on. I mean blessed are you of the Lord, you know. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So he's bragging, I've done it. What you asked me to do, God is great, and I've done what God sent me to do. No, you're a phony and a liar. I love Samuel, what a tough guy. And Samuel said, what, what then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? <laughs> in other words, you say one thing, but the evidence proves the other. You tell me you're walking with God, that you're doing everything right, then what is all the other, what is all this, these animals I hear in the background? Ah, Oh, yeah, you killed everything, didn't you? You know? And so he's busted. You can say all you want, I've done the right thing, you know, whatever. But Jesus said, what? You'll know them by their fruit. Anybody can tell you they're walking with God, but if they're walking in the world, you can see it. You can smell sin a mile away. If it's, I mean, if they're really deeply into sin, they can say whatever they want. You know, again, he, he tries to pull this fake stuff, but somebody who's walking in tune with the Spirit is not going to be tricked by this. He goes, yeah, well, that's not what the evidence shows. What are all these animals I hear if you've obeyed the Lord? And Saul said, now look, this reminds me of Adam in the garden pointing at his wife. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. He's throwing everybody under the bus. I didn't do it. It was them that did this. The problem is, you're the king, Saul. You're the one responsible. I'm holding you accountable. You can't put this off on the people. You're the man. So these people, they, they've spared the best of the sheep and oxen. But now he tries to make it sound spiritual. To sacrifice to the Lord God. God didn't say keep them to sacrifice to me. He said kill them all. But he sounds spiritual. Oh, you're going to do this sacrifice. Oh, how godly you are. Lord, you know, let me live the, win the lottery and I'll tithe on it. You know, let me, Lord, you know, go to the races, the horse races, or let me, let me, let me, let me cheat this guy on this deal. And if I do something a little crooked with the taxes, I'll get such a great return. I'll tie to the church. God says, if you do something illegal or wrong or sinful for God, don't bring it to the church. He says, it's an abomination to me. And so he's acting like, I've done all this, but I'm going to give it to God. Well, God doesn't want it. And the rest we've utterly destroyed. Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. I love, Saul, Samuel's a tough guy. By the way, this whole thing about pastors and people that serve the Lord having to be kind of just this little, you know, gentle, soft, weak thing. That's not what I find in the scripture. You look at God's men in the Bible, they were tough. They were warriors, man. We're going to see that Samuel is tough. This guy was a tough cookie. He said, be quiet. And I'll tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said, speak on. And Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission. And he said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they're consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? In other words, you knew that was God. Why did you swoop down on the spoil? What a picture, how picturesque. Oh, you couldn't wait to get all the reward and to get all this stuff and you're acting so fake and phony and righteous before me. Why did you do this evil in the sight of the Lord? And now he continues this, even though he's busted. Look what Samuel, Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. No, you're lying, you have not. If you obeyed the voice of the Lord, you'd have done what he said. And I've gone on the mission which the Lord sent me and I brought back Agag, king of Amalek. Here's, I obeyed the Lord, but I disobeyed. It's just what he said. I obeyed the Lord, but I brought back Agag. God said, go kill Agag. I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. No, you can't use the word utterly because you haven't. Agag's still alive. And apparently left alone long enough to actually have a child that's going to come along later because of what's going to happen to Saul later on in his life. So didn't even guard him well. But the people, he blames the people again. Lord, it's the woman. <laughs> 
But the people took the plunder, the sheep and the ox, and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. But now he tries to put a, a righteous look to it again, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So all the reason we brought these back is we wanted to offer them to God. God says, you want to offer it to me? Obey me. Do what I ask you to do. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Guys, note this. This is huge. Partial obedience is disobedience. I want to say it again. Partial obedience is disobedience. But I mostly obey. I'm doing almost everything God wants me to do. I know there's a few things I'm not. It's disobedience. It just is. And Saul is being disobedient, thinking somehow he can be partially obedient and please the Lord. And God says, no, you can't. And I'd rather you obey me than offer me all the sacrifices on the planet. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. So rather than giving up things for the Lord, it's better just to obey him. And to heed, that is to heed the Lord, is better than the fat of rams. Look at this. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Why would he compare rebellion to witchcraft? Because you're making your own path. I will do what I want. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to be my own God. I'll do my own thing. I'm not going to obey the Bible. He says, That's, you might as well be a witch or a warlock. It's witchcraft because you're trying to be your own God. You're trying to control your own universe. You know, be the, the, the one that, you, the, that runs the destiny of your own life. He says, no, there's a God in heaven that does that. So if you rebel against him, it's the same thing as witchcraft, which is interesting because in a very short amount of time, not tonight, but we'll see it later, Saul, because God won't answer him, is going to run to a witch. Isn't that interesting? For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. He's going to run to a witch, the witch at Endor, because God won't speak to him. Now his rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And look at this, and stubbornness, that he was stubbornly disobeying God's command. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you've rejected the word of the Lord. Or rather, let me read that differently. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Wow. God gave him another chance. Saul still disobeyed directly and just right in God's face. And Samuel said, you're done. You're done. And Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. And isn't that something? Once you get caught, now confess. For I've transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And again, what does the Bible say? The fear of man is what? It's a snare. Isn't that something? How long does it take us to get over the fear of man? It took me years to get over it. I don't know that I'm 100% over it. I hope so. I think I am. But I fought with that for years, fearing people. It's like, no, I got to fear God. He says, the fear of man's a snare. It causes you to do things you shouldn't do. You disobey God when you fear man. Because I feared people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. He shouldn't have been asking uh, his pardon. He should have been asking God's pardon. Although, you know, maybe to ask forgiveness is okay. But he should have been saying, you know, pray with me that God will forgive me. But Samuel said, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and the robe tore, just rips. God is gonna use this in such an amazing way through Samuel here to paint this picture. Again, it's interesting, the edge of the robe is where they put the little seat seat. There's these little, these tassels they would wear that represented the word of God and God's authority. And the fact that he grabbed that is it's as if God's power and God's word and God's authority had been ripped away from Saul and it tears. And I see Samuel just walking away and it ripping and he turns and looks at him. And Samuel said, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. He's talking about David. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent. God will be faithful to his nation, even though you blew it. For he's not a man that he should relent. God will still watch over his people, but you're done, in other words. And he said, I've sinned. Yet honor me now. Notice not the Lord. It's all about me with Saul. Honor me now and please before the elders of the people. I don't want to look foolish. Before Israel and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. And look at the graciousness of Samuel. Samuel's gracious here for the sake of the kingdom to honor the king. Even though God was done with Saul. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Yeah, I love it. These last few verses. Now we see how tough Samuel was. Then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is gone. Now let's get a picture of Samuel before I read these last few verses and we end tonight. Remember who Samuel was? Samuel was an old man by now. First of all, Samuel was a Nazarite. 
What did the Nazarites never do? They never cut their hair. Here stands a grandpa who's never cut his hair. How long is his hair? Probably down to the ground. So get a picture of what he looks like. Number two, he's a grandpa. What color is his hair? Gray. You got this gray-haired, long-haired, bearded biker. No, I'm just kidding, but that kind of look. Bring him here. And the guy walks up going, ooh, who's this guy with the super long hair and looking kind of wild at me? Agag's freaking out. And, and he says this, Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. Unless you think men of God are wimpy. Look at this. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord. I can just see that hair slinging. I'm sorry, I visualize things. Maybe too much. I apologize if I took you to my world. But tell me Samuel wasn't a tough guy to be feared. A man of God. God can be gentle and gracious and loving. But for those who totally reject him and live in evil, he is to be greatly feared. And now we see the fierceness of God coming through the man of God in this awesome picture of this man wearing this big mantle and this long gray hair and this beard that's down to whatever. And, ah, the Lord God! Right? Sorry, I'm getting into it. Let's back off. You know, like, Dad, I was just getting milk out of the fridge. Oh, I'm sorry. I was picturing a scene in my mind. Anyway, but let's go. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And this is so sad. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Look at the heart. Of, I love Samuel. Now, we saw the fierceness of Samuel. Look at the heart of the man of God on the other side. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Oh, Lord, Saul, Saul, why did you do it? You could, God could have used you so amazingly. Man, let's make sure that we don't become like Saul. Listen, if God, if we've been living like Saul and living for ourselves, God gives, God gives second, third, fourth, fifth, umpteen chances. Respond to it. Obey the voice of the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice. Don't get religious. Run to Jesus and obey him. And God will use you. And rather than standing in fear before the Lord, we stand in rejoicing at the gracious goodness of our God. So what an amazing portion of Scripture. Go ahead and read the next three chapters, and we'll see how far we get next time. Let's pray. Your word, Lord, is amazing. Truly, you're a God of incredible grace and mercy and love, but you're also a God that's awesome and to be feared. And we see that all through Samuel tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the example you gave us in Samuel. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, the warnings you give us in Saul's life. And God, if we are living like Saul, let us repent tonight and obey you. Not acting religious, not trying to be something we're not, not openly disobeying, but Lord, obeying. And if we haven't been, then we'd repent tonight and get it right. And Lord, I want to pray as well, if there's any Amalekites that you've been pointing out in people's hearts tonight, and they know what those Amalekites are, it's time to deal with it. Let them deal, let us deal with our Amalekites that we don't find ourselves being slain on Mount Gilboa when instead, Lord, we could have been rejoicing at the work of God in our life and the lives of the people around us. It all comes down to choices. Lord, let us make wise choices and be obedient to you, our God. Thank you, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves you guys so much.